see this pop up here in a second. Welcome in, Hokies fans, to this week's edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to talk it all football today, a completely football-focused show. We have some major movement on the coaching staff, and it could impact the offense in a very big way. That's all coming up next on episode 285 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We get things going right now. We welcome you back in as we record on Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023 from the Tech Sideline Studio at the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center right here in Blacksburg, Virginia. We welcome you in whether you are listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you consume your podcasts, or if you're watching on YouTube. If you do happen to be watching us on YouTube, make sure that you leave a like and subscribe while you're there, and also turn on that notification bell so that you don't miss any of our future TSL content. Tech Sideline today is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. They're giving away one free annual TSL Pass subscription each week through January and all the way up through mid-March. To enter, hit the link in the YouTube description or find one of their ads on the techsideline.com website. Be sure to enter every week and remember who you choose to bank with can make all the difference in your overall experience. First Bank and Trust Company is the bank that puts you first. Visit www.firstbank.com dot com to learn more. 
All right, introductions are in order. Across the way is managing editor David Cunningham. To my right, lead analyst and columnist Chris Coleman. In the fourth chair, chair today, founder and general manager Will Stewart. Behind the scenes producing his first podcast, Kyle Marshak. And I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. Thanks so much for being here with us. Uh, Will, we don't have a winner this week, am I correct? We do. We do? All right. Yes, I was actually just taking that note. Perfect. Uh, this week's winner, it's number seven out of ten. It is Thomas Reed of Parrot, Virginia. Okay. Parrot is a small community, so congratulations. Parrot River Road. Thomas. For, yes, uh, I've gone fishing down there. Some good spots. Everybody tries to go fishing on this side is that in South of the West river. Virginia? Where is it? No, it's in. Where would you, where would you I don't just. Know, I don't know where. I guess I'll look it up. Parrot's uh, <laughs> it? like out Fairlawn, right? Yeah, that's what okay. I'm, yeah. yeah. It's all by the, uh, you know, like Parrot is on the other side of the New River across from where, you know, where you get in a New River Junction. To, yeah. uh, Parrot, well, Parrot's yeah. like across okay, the yes, river. Okay, yes, yes. I asked if so, it was Southwest Virginia. You yeah, said no. Oh, I thought you said South Side. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Anyway, South yes, Virginia. Parrot is a small community. By Radford. Okay. <laughs> so so Parrot's getting lots of pub here on the TSL yeah. podcast. <laughs> and uh, welcome to uh, Kyle producing his first uh, podcast today. Like literally before we went live, I was training him how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> now he's produced TSL today. He just hasn't done a live show yet. So anyway, yes, Thomas Reed of Parrot, Virginia, number seven out of 10. So we got three more weeks of this. Awesome. Well, let's get into our first half content today. We're going to split the show a little different today. Instead of making it very front-loaded, we're kind of going to split it down the middle, go half hour, half hour is kind of our goal. We'll see how well we actually stick to that, but we're definitely going to try our absolute hardest. Uh, our first half content, big breaking news in Virginia Tech football. Brad Glenn is leaving Virginia Tech as the quarterback's coach and is taking the job as the offensive coordinator at the University of Cincinnati, joining his buddy Scott Satterfield, who was named the head coach after Luke Fickle left Cincinnati. Um, your immediate reactions, gentlemen. I get, it's pretty common to see coaches hire coaches that they're familiar with and that they've coached with in the past. <clears throat> so it's not surprising from that standpoint. I didn't see it coming per se, but you, you're never in this business. You don't really get taken by surprise by things like that. Um, I certainly don't think Brent Pry was taken uh, by surprise with it. Uh, probably some Cincinnati fans were taken by surprise with it because think about it from a from a Cincinnati perspective. Try to put put the shoe on. Uh, you know, put your feet in that shoe, so to speak. Like Virginia Tech had, had one of the worst offenses ever historically in S and P Plus this past year. Yeah. So from a Cincinnati standpoint, okay, we're hiring their passing game coordinator and cornerback and quarter corner. Excuse me, I can't talk today. Quarterbacks coach from one of the worst offenses ever, and now we're giving him a promotion as our offensive coordinator. If Virginia Tech did that, our fans would flip and. I probably would too, yeah. to be honest. But that's not what we're really here to talk well, about. And you got to remember too, Cincinnati is what two years removed from a college football playoff, right? Right, like, right. that's insane. And they're a Power Five now. Yeah, they're true. going to the Big Twelve big this 12. year. Yeah. yeah um, for some context, Pry, uh, Pry, uh, Brad Glenn was on the Appalachian State staff mm -hmm. uh, with Scott Satterfield for like five or six years. Uh, Glenn coached wide receivers actually, and Satterfield coach quarterbacks yeah. so um they they kind of go back and as i as i said uh yesterday to somebody you know if satterfield needed a or in case glenn needed a letter of recommendation so to speak well Stu holt worked under satterfield tex running backs coach mm -hmm. worked under satterfield at louisville um just last year so or two years ago i guess so um yeah i'm not i think the my, my first uh kind of thought was wow because Fontel Mines got a contract extension because he was doing so well and he had some suitors which he actually mentioned to us yesterday uh, when we got a chance to talk to chat with him um, and Brent Pry rewarded him he's done such a good job with the contract extension which we've talked about um, he wanted to keep the staff together Pry and it kind of is a little bit surprising because all of a sudden You've got somebody who you didn't think was going to leave, leave all of a sudden, and now you've got to figure out, you know, who you're replacing them with. And spring practice starts in less than two weeks, mm -hmm. so you don't really have much time to waste. Uh, from everything we understand, and, and from what uh, talking with some coaches yesterday, it's going to be a, a quick thing. It should be done in, in the near future. So, um, but I, I think that was kind of the biggest thing to me is just 
I don't think anybody expected anybody to leave. It wasn't like, oh my God, he's leaving. It was more so a, wow, he's deciding, like like somebody from the staff is going. And I don't think Glenn probably would have been the first person I would have said, okay, he's the guy that's going to be leaving. If I had if I had to guess. I think there are some coaches that did other really, really, really good jobs last year that would probably be you know, higher on my list in terms of if I was picking a staff, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, and, it's, and it's like... I wouldn't necessarily have forecasted a promotion for somebody from the that Tech too. offensive staff yes. this past year. <laughs> Y'all are cold, man. <laughs> it's cold, but I mean, you would, it's not. It's not something that like. I mean, it would be the first thought to enter your fact. mind it's statistically. Yeah. <laughs> that was not a good offense. So, how does this impact the current quarterback room as well as the incoming quarterbacks and Kyron Drones, Pop Watson, etc.? You know, I, I kind of wonder if this wasn't in the works for a while because. When you go back to the drones recruitment and and the Pop Watson recruitment, like it was Tyler Bowen going down to Texas on a plane to meet with Kieran Drones, right? It wasn't the quarterback's coach. Kyron, Kyron, Kyron you're right, it's Kyron. Uh, it, it wasn't the quarterback's coach. It wasn't Glenn. So those guys seem more like Glenn-type quarterbacks just based like if you go back and watch his offenses at Georgia State, but I also know that that Bowen, you know, wants to run RPO, and RPO is a was a staple to a certain extent of the Joe Moorhead offense. So it kind of goes back to me to like, I still don't know what that offense last year was supposed to look like. I don't know if Tyler Bowen knows. I mean, he comes from one background. Glenn came from another background. There, there's there was never any any coaching carryover between the two. And then Rudolph comes from another background. Uh, I don't know what it was supposed to look like. Um, I don't. I will, I will say this: I, I, I've never, looking back on it, I don't think Glenn and Bowen were a good mix, and I think that impacted the offense, uh, and it impacted the performance of the players. Like if the, if the, if your two coaches, if your if your offensive coordinator and your quarterbacks coach slash passing game coordinator aren't on the same page, and of course that's going to negatively affect your players. Of course it's going to hurt your wide receivers, their performance. Of course it's going to hurt the performance of your quarterbacks. Um, I think if this next quarterbacks coach, if he's someone that has crossover experience for, with Tyler Bowen, if he's someone who came up in the Joe Moorhead offensive system like Tyler Bowen did, then I think it will make all of Tech's quarterbacks better this year, whoever the starter is. Whether it's Drones, whether it's Wells, whether it's somebody else, that quarterback will be better simply because they're, their coach and then the offensive coordinator, are, they see things a little more eye-to-eye. They come from similar backgrounds and things like that. So I just think that the, the offensive coaching staff, lacked cohesiveness this past year. I think one of the biggest things, probably talked about it when he first got hired, right? When he was hiring all his different coaches, it was kind of a a pot of ideas, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody throw your ideas into the pot and we'll we'll figure out something. I think there were, were too many cooks in the kitchen. Too, <laughs> you know, uh, like I, I think there were too many different guys that were trying to do different things and that just didn't work sometimes you're in chemistry class and you mix a bunch of stuff together and, and it's it awesome other times it blows up the classroom yeah <laughs> i i think obviously we've seen like and maybe because it was more of on the defensive side of the ball you know, it was what pry wanted but but we never really saw a lot of those i mean even, i would say the talent level on the defensive side of the ball was about the same maybe a little bit better than, than that on the offensive side of the ball. But there were times where the offense just looked completely out of whack, completely out of rim, vanilla, no creativity. And mm-hmm. I think there were too many cooks in the kitchen. Everybody's trying, you know, everybody's trying to implement their own ideas. And instead of just sticking with what Tyler Bowen wants to do, we understand, you know, he that was his first year of actually being an offensive coordinator at the Power 5 level. Right, he had some previous experience doing some of that here and there, not much. But you never know; he never really got time to figure it out on his own. I, I think there was probably influence from all over, not just Brad Glenn, but Fonto Mind and, and Stu Holt and everybody, Joe Rudolph. Everybody's tossing in their ideas because everybody has been in good offenses. It, it, before. At one point, they sent Glenn up to the booth with him, and remember, Glenn is writing down. Here's what I would call in this situation and yeah. kind of showing it to him and things like that. And which seemed like a good idea at the time, but like 
if they're not on the same page, yes. then is it a good idea? Yeah, so. you, it, it's it's tough because Bowen. I mean, and this is all hypothetical, but Bowen could be thinking something completely different than what Glenn is thinking, but might feel obligated to. You know what I mean? There, there's a I don't want to say a clash, but mm. different ideas in there, and that does not mix well when. You know, I, I can just imagine if I'm working with both you and Will, and Will's telling me one thing, and you're telling me another thing. <laughs> right. Well, that never happened. <laughs> and, and what am I supposed to do, right? Which boss sure. do I listen to? Right. One uh, of them's my quarterback's coach, and one of them's my offensive coordinator. Sure. So I think there there was probably – so I think the biggest thing, like you said, is get somebody that Tyler Bowen's familiar with, that Tyler Bowen can work with. And I know Tyler Bowen kind of handpicked this – helped Brahai handpick the staff a little bit. Uh, offensively, um, but I think this one will probably be more shaded towards Bowen than, I, than Pry. Yeah, I think it should be. Um, I, I think obviously Pry had connections, but uh, to to Brad Glenn, but Bowen really didn't. At least not nothing direct. They yeah. both came up in different offensive systems and things like that. And not that you're ever going to have a perfect coaching staff in college where everybody came up in the right system and everything. Like that, or everybody came up in the same system, but uh, I do think in this particular case, not being privy, like I can't go out and interview candidates and see if their philosophies match up with Tyler Bowens and everything. That's entirely up to them to decide. Uh, there could be guys out there who's have no whose paths have never crossed with Tyler Bowen, who could be perfect for the yes. job just simply because they have the same philosophy. It just so happened that this one correct. did not seem to work. Right, right. Um, but not not being able to interview any of those guys or meet them at coaching condition uh, conventions. conventions. My preference right now is for this next hire to not be a Brent Pry guy per se, but a Tyler Bowen. Somebody slash that fits what Tyler Bowen wants more, to do. Right, right. It, it's it's more important that this next that the quarterbacks coach, in my opinion, be a fit with Bowen than a fit with Pry per se. If you're a fit with Bowen, you're going to be a fit with, with Pry, Pry. By, by default. Yeah. Um, now, of course, but, like, yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say it's kind of like um, not all, you know, not all rectangles are squares, yeah. but all squares are rectangles. Kind sure, of thing. Like, sure. Like, like everybody, like you are going, if you fit with Bowen, you're going to fit with Pry, but not everybody that fits with Pry is going to fit with Bowen. Correct. Why, and maybe he was... But why wasn't Glenn considered for the offensive coordinator job coming in? He was an offensive coordinator before sure, this. Sure, that's actually a good question. And I've never quite been able to wrap my head around that uh, because to me, like he had been an offensive coordinator before. Like not a dominant one, but like w when you go back and watch some of the Georgia State games and I'm like, I like what they're doing with the quarterbacks. It seems like they're getting the most out of their talent. Like they had a quarterback, I think it was his last year there, it was a guy they recruited out of high school and as a high school senior completed like 51 or 52 percent of his passes. Talented guy, but very raw. And they, they take him at Georgia State and run an offense for him where there's a lot of high percentage throws, a lot of uh, smoke and mirrors, so to speak. And they got the most out of the quarterback that they could and they had a good offense because, because of it. So uh, I, honestly, like if you're just picking resumes – he had a stronger resume than Bowen. Now you could also, but he'd also been doing it for longer. Right, correct. And, and you you could think that maybe Bowen has a high, higher ceiling, and that if you hire two ex coordinators in your, you know, assistant coordinator position, so to speak, that everything's going to mix fine. Um, but it's a fair question. Um, and I actually wrote in my column today that I, I did like, like on paper, if 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 you're having an offensive coordinator draft. Right. As, as opposed to like if you're playing fantasy football and you also get to draft a coaching staff instead of a uh, it, as well as your players and yeah. things like that. So like Glenn would get drafted as offensive coordinator before Bowen would simply because he's been an offensive coordinator and has halfway decent <coughs> numbers, uh, you know, on his resume, so to speak. So. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm like I said. I, I don't know what this uh, this past year's offense was supposed to look like. I really don't. Um, but if we get somebody from the Joe Moorhead system, which is the system Tyler Bowen came in, then I think next year 
by going back and looking at Joe Moorhead offenses, I think we can have a pretty darn certain idea of what the offense is supposed to look like going the next year. And then we'll really be able to judge Tyler Bowen. Like, I don't think he had a good year this past year. That could be because, like, the staff wasn't a great fit with, like, him and the passing game coordinator. But now if you get two guys from the same school of thought, maybe that makes Tyler Bowen better. Or, or maybe he's not good. We won't know that, though, and we have a better chance of knowing that now. Yeah. Like, I, if, I, if, if Glenn was still on the, on the staff and we went through this, this next season and Tech wasn't much better offensively, you're kind of asking the same question again. Is it Bowen or is it just the yeah. fit of the staff? Well, now that the staff is changing, if it doesn't work this year, we'll know why. You'll be able to see both the statistically from Tyler Bowen and from Brad Glenn. They'll right. both be coordinating their that's own tr- offenses. That's true. You'll be able to see which one statistically <laughs> is better. Right. And but I do think it's interesting because if we had stuck yeah, like kind of like you said, if we had Virginia Tech had stuck with having Bowen and Glenn together, you could say, "Oh, well, it's Brad Glenn's fault or it's Tyler Bowen's fault." But you were never probably really able to pinpoint it. And now mm-hmm. Tyler Bowen has an opportunity, I think, to make it his own, right? If it wasn't his own before, it should have been. But if it wasn't his own before, this is his opportunity to craft this offense into what he wants it to be. There's At this point, it's not like if if Glenn was an extra cook in the kitchen, he's no longer there. Right. And and it's like go make your own go make the meal the way you want it to make. And I want to I want to say this, you know, we got to interview all the assistants yesterday, and, and we'll talk about that in the second half of the show. It's te- text coaches are all very good interviews. Like I like talking to Tyler Bowen. Um, he's a highly intelligent man. Like if you just based based it off conversations, just one on one conversations you can have with someone. Like he would probably be, you would probably leave the conversation thinking he's our best offensive coordinator, and he knows ever. what he's talking about. Right, right. So, uh, but you know, so there's more to it than that. So, like, I don't, like I said, I don't think he had a good year, but I also think there could be reasons for that outside of him, his control, outside of you know the talent level. But we've talked about that the talent level wasn't great, but also so many of the returning players who had played well in 2021 did not play well in 2022. So that's more of a coaching issue. But is the coaching issue because the coaches weren't good enough or because they just weren't a fit together? And we will find out now. Uh, I like Tyler Bowen a lot. I would very much prefer it if he works out as the offensive coordinator, <laughs> but. You know, like I said, I think we'll find out after this season. Grand scheme of things, I think initial reaction when I saw this, I was like, ah, geez, like this feels like a blow. Now that we're talking about it a little more, is this maybe a good thing for the program? Uh, And you can look at this as a positive. I don't know if we'll know until the end of the season. Yeah. Because it it could be, I mean, imagine this. Imagine the offense actually looks pretty good this year, right? Then I think people will be like, Okay, not bad. Especially like a Brad Glenn's having success too. It's like, you know, everybody found their true path, right? If the offense is not good, you people are going to know where exactly to direct their criticism. Right. Tyler Bone actually joked about that yesterday. He's like, you know, I know I'm going to get all the hate kind of along those lines. Sure. And, and and I think, again, we will know. I think it's too early too early to tell whether or not it's, it's good or bad. But what I will say is... Like I said just before, Tyler Bowen now kind of has complete control of this thing. I haven't had a complete chance to wrap my head around it because it was yesterday was kind of a whirlwind day. We had a uh, media launch in at noon or thereabouts. Student athlete performance center that was, was that was great. Point. We're going to talk all about definitely that too, if, if you're being recruited by Virginia Tech, you should sign with the Hokies just because of that place. <laughs> um, nothing else matters except the meals in there. They're amazing. But uh, anyway. Uh, and then at five o'clock, you know, we had interviews with all the football coaches. And then last night there was a basketball game. So I haven't really had a chance to completely wrap my head around it. I consider it the change to be a no lose situation. I've been secretly hoping for some change since the end of last year. And I'm not normally one, I don't believe in change for change's sake. And I also don't believe in giving coaches a short leash. But I also think that there was an issue with the Virginia Tech offense this past year and the issue either was Tyler Bowen or it was that the staff was not the right fit together 
So by changing up the staff a little bit, we're about to find out which one of those things it was this past year. So we're going to be in a better position to go forward at the end of the 2023 season now that this change has happened. We should be able to know... Whether it's positive or negative. Correct. Correct. We should know after this season exactly what we need to do with the offensive coordinator. You know, uh, like is Bowen the guy or is he not? You know, is it has it been Bowen's fault or was the staff just just the wrong mix? I think people just want some uh, closure there, as far as okay, what's going to happen? Like like nobody nobody wants to go into this long cycle of. Some people like the offensive coordinator. Somebody don't. Some people don't. Uh, we we can't quite tell whether he's good or whether he's not good. He brings a lot of starters back next year, so let's give him one more year. Nope. Like, you, if you get into that cycle long enough, next thing you know, you've had a mediocre offensive coordinator for eight years and you've never made any progress. Well, it's isn't he on a big contract, though? Fairly, uh, it's a three-year contract, three year contract, which is long. So yeah, he's yeah. got this season. It's long. Right? It's we don't really have the finances to buy him out necessarily. Like, we, we, we well, well, you could, but <laughs> it's not ideal. Um, but you could after this coming season, right? Um, but but, but I, like I, don't, I don't, I don't, want to get to that point. But I also don't want to get drugged into this long road of mediocrity either. Like, if he's not good, I want to know it as soon as possible. And you, will. so you can, and I, and I think we're we'll know it after this year. Will, let's hear from you. Let's see if you got anything to chime in from the fourth chair on this. No. no? <laughs> well, then let's go to whatever you do well, got on the fourth chair. I think chair. that these guys uh, cover things pretty well uh, as far as that stuff goes. What I wanted to pimp is uh, we did a interview with Whit Babcock, uh, recorded it last Thursday. He came in, sat down right there where David is, and I talked to him for an hour and five minutes. So it was a pretty long interview. And we covered about 12 different topics. You know, we wound up grouping it later into 12 different topics. And uh, 65 minutes and 15 of those 65 minutes were spent on football scheduling. Mm. So uh, what we're doing on Tech Sideline is we're publishing this in three parts. And we've got the transcript of the interview so you can read what he said. And then we have embedded videos. So if you're not quite sure what his inflection was or what he meant by something, you can hit the video and, and watch and listen to him actually say the things that he is saying. So it's a pretty good presentation. It's a subscriber only feature. And I say it all the time. Um, you know, we got the podcast and everything, but really our bread and butter that's kept us going for 25 plus years is the subscription content that we run on the website. So I encourage people to subscribe, uh, check out this interview, part one yesterday, part two, will go out later today and then part three will be tomorrow and if you want to sign up, sign up for a monthly subscription first month is free and student subscriptions are free so that's the sales job <laughs> i did want to drill down a little bit into football scheduling everybody's always all right all irate because tech is playing liberty and odu and in particular they're traveling to liberty and odu you know every, every right. once in a while and and unfortunately, two of those fell in the same year last year. So well, we got into when you're that. three and eight. Who else do you want to play? I mean, <laughs> so. I mean, if we can't play those two teams, then we might. Then we shouldn't play anybody, <laughs> right. should we? Right. Right. It's anyway. funny. Witt, Witt says the same sort of things during the interview, but um, I did a I did a little bit of research, and in 2006, Tech had four out of conference home games, and three of them were by games, where you pay a team to come to your place, play one game, and then they go away. Three of the games that year were buy games, those one-off games. And Tech paid a total of $2.2 million for those, so they were an average of $700,000 apiece, which is fairly expensive. Um, these days, uh, Kent State, is last year, got paid $5.2, a total of $5.2 million to go to three different places. I don't remember what they were. One of Georgia. Them Georgia. Jo- one of them was Georgia. Georgia was like $1.9 million. One of them was out west. But so they did three buy games for an average of 1.7 million. So Kent State, who came to Virginia Tech in 2006, is now traveling those places for double to triple the price that it used to be back then. Back then. So uh, this is why you wind up with the Liberty and ODU situations. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about Liberty in particular. Virginia Tech's played Liberty, I think, four times since 2016. They're going to take a break from them. But from 2027 through 2030, Tech is going to play Liberty four times. 
first three in Lane Stadium, and the fourth one will be at Liberty. Virginia Tech is paying 500000 for each of those home games. So Virginia Tech's getting three home games for the same $1.5 million price tag. The trade-off is they have to go on the road. And when they go on the road to an ODU or a Liberty, Witt says Tech gets paid about a quarter of a million dollars, which basically pays their expenses, you know. Um, so that's why you see this sort of thing happening. It always comes down to the money. If Virginia Tech could pay the Kent States of the world to come in and, you know, do a one-off game for one and a half million, they'd do it. That's what the SEC and Big Ten teams are doing. And when Tech did that in 2006, that was right after ACC expansion. At that point, the TV contracts were so much in the ACC's favor that the per-school payout was higher in the ACC than any other league. Virginia Tech was making more off its TV deal then than Georgia is, than Georgia was. Back right then, yes. Right, right. But, so Virginia Tech could win a bidding war back then I for know. the for games like that. Now they can't. So you have to play. You have to you have, have to these schedule series smart. Like that. You have right. to schedule smart and be financially smart. Right. And and that's uh, it was really good. Just reading it, I edited the transcript yeah. with Will. But yeah, and so we so we cover a lot of topics, and there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, I do remember the ACC shortly after the 2000. 2003 2004 expansion pounding their chest and saying our per team payout was the biggest of any mm-hmm. conference and it was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 31 million dollars well that was approaching 20 years ago and it hasn't really increased all that much right and the then the sec and big 10 have just shot past the ACC. Uh, you know expansion was brilliant short term for the acc and swafford always deserves, deserves credit but it also poked the bear or in this case, bears, <laughs> yeah. right? Like the ACC, the SEC and Big Ten were kind of asleep at the time. And the ACC is like, okay, we're going to steal a march on them and we're going to start winning this battle. And then they woke up and said, isn't that funny? The cute little ACC <laughs> with all their Wake Forests and Dukes think they're going to mess with <laughs> us in football. I guess we actually have to get serious now and fight back. They did. Here we are. It's, it's funny <laughs> the things that change college athletics like uh, – Nick Saban changed college football with a staffing sure. model. The Big Ten changed college athletics by launching a network. And, yeah, and you know, these are things that didn't – the SEC network didn't exist back then. The Big Ten network didn't even exist back then. I think it was a brainchild at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. All right, everything out of the fourth chair? I think so for now. Uh, he. Uh, we also did talk about the ACC scheduling model and why did the Miami – Virginia Tech rivalry go away. Mm. So that's okay. in there as well. And he he talked. Uh, I like Wit, and Wit likes us. He likes Tech sideline. He's a tough interview because he he speaks very imprecisely. <laughs> I'm a numbers guy, and it's really hard to pin him down on numbers. Like those numbers I just gave you, I had to kind of pin him down. You know, <laughs> but he 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 made a joke in in the in the interview of if I need to know. I don't remember what we we're talking about. I it was the ACC. Ne- it was yeah. ACC network revenue. He said. He said, if, I, if I need to know the exact number, I can just walk down the hall and ask somebody, you know. And and so from that standpoint, he can be a, be a difficult interview. But uh, he did talk about um, the ACC scheduling model, and that's in the piece that's going up today. And that and that wasn't. I mean, you guys covered a ton of other topics too. And we yeah. are known for our podcasting these days. People come up to us in Castle on Lane and be like, "Hey, <laughs> love the podcast." But our pay content, our written content, is actually way better than our podcasting ability to be honest and yeah, we're kind of, and this is a feature that we're kind of combining it is a podcast that is and it's a it's a pay podcast with with a written feature as well with a transcript which is pay also yeah so you won't see it on our our podcast feeds and you won't see yeah. it publicly available on youtube uh, so I'll, I'll real quick run down the uh, topics the apparel contract the famous nike contract which is getting renewed uh this at, at the end of june uh, fundraising facilities, NIL, Brent Prize first year, football scheduling, and this year's uh, football ticket sales. The idea of hosting the NIT for the men and the women's NCAA tournament in the same week. We talked about that. Talked about Hokie softball and Witt's plans for the stadium and why doesn't he charge for softball. Why he did not care about free? the press box. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> I was sad about that part. <laughs> uh, we talk a little bit about the good coaches he's got, the NCAA woes, and then we talk about the ACC network. So a lot of good stuff. Awesome. 
All right, well, Chris and David had the opportunity to sit down and interview a whole bunch of the Virginia Tech football coaches yesterday. They got some great insights. Stick around. That's coming up next after the break. Welcome back, Hokie Nation, to episode 285 of the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by First Bank and Trust Company. The TSL Podcast is also presented by the Hokie Way. They support Virginia Tech, our athletes, and our community. 
At the Hokie Way, we work to support Virginia Tech, student athletes, and our community, which was just read twice. Together, we create a win for all. Learn more about our mission and how to get involved. Go to thehokieway.org to learn more. Apologies, I'm not sure how I typed that twice, but regardless, <laughs> let's go ahead and get into our second half content. You guys had the opportunity to sit down and talk to a whole bunch of the football coaches. In fact, all of them uh, besides Brad Glenn, Derek Jones, and obviously Coach Pry. Um, I'm going to let you guys kind of take the reins on this one first and foremost. What was overall that experience like before we go coach by coach? Always enjoy talking to text coaches. They're, uh, it's more than – like they can have conversations with you while answering your questions yeah. and things like that. Uh, they're an ex- excellent group to interview. So that, that was so – it was basically like the same setting as it was last year shortly after they all got hired. Yeah, I thought it was good. Um, it's always nice. We don't mean we don't – they they try to make assistance available throughout the year, but that's kind of like one at a time. Yeah. This is a good opportunity to kind of get everybody in the same room and kind of catch up with them, especially during the winter before they get into spring ball because maybe not necessarily you, Chris, but I'm going to be at practice, you know, multiple times over the next month or two ahead of the spring game and it's good to, uh, I, I, this is I guess it's a little bit of a slight at, at the Fuente era but like we never really got to talk to assistants mm-hmm. so it's nice that we have the opportunity and th- that they are making it an it an objective to let us have access to the assistant coaches Correct. and then they're all nice to talk to I mean like Sean Quinn's hilarious and asked us how the first thing he asked us was how the food was in the student athlete performance center. He um, already knows how well, how good. He, oh it yeah. Is, you know, <laughs> um, so I'm going to let you guys pick, are we going offense first or defense first? We can uh, go offense. D- I think oh, look, the you, the, the offensive go- coaches in general set more. Now Derek Jones was not there. So there were fewer defensive coaches. Correct. There's more to talk about with the offensive coaches. I think so you want to go defense first. Go, we, let's and, go and we, defense. And first. we can close with the offense. Yeah. Get All it out of the way real quick. Sounds good. Mr. Price. JC Price. Uh, J- I mean, so one of the big things. So I've got a I've got a list of notes for you, those of you watching live. Um, so I'm gonna go first, and then let yep. Chris go off yep. the dome. For those um, that don't know, and I apologize for interrupting as well. I should say their title. He's the associate head coach and the defensive line coach. Um, but. what what is Jeanette's first name? James. J- uh, because uh, one of the the first thing he mentioned was Jeanette, mm-hmm. and how. The reason why Tech got Jeanette was because Jeanette's father played at East Carolina, I believe, right. under Mike Gentry. When Mike Gentry was a strength and conditioning coach at East Carolina before before he came to Tech. And I had forgotten that that's where Mike Gentry was before he came to Virginia Tech. Because he had been in Virginia Tech. He was in Virginia Tech for so long, yeah. So, so to fill in for people who don't know, uh, James Jeanette is a uh, Juco, Juco defensive, defensive, end defensive end. Yeah. Right. And, and JC said, the first, you know, they, he and, uh, and Jeanette's dad just started – Chatting about the uh, the uh, Gentry days, yeah. Um, JC kind of was as Chris and I were talking about. It wasn't like he said anything groundbreaking. Yeah, he's he's yeah. got a he's got pretty much the same room he had last year, right? Mostly. Norrell Pollard, Mario Kendricks came back, and I thought that was interesting. I asked him what what excites you about having them back, and he said after a three and eight season, not everybody would have chosen to come back. Mm-hmm. It kind of shows about what we are about, what Virginia Tech is about, what this program is about. And he specifically said they had opportunities elsewhere. He did. So they didn't. They never entered the transfer portal, and they had opportunities elsewhere, which kind of lets you know where college football recruiting is these days. I was going to say, that shows you that even though they're West. not supposed to, they're Correct. being talked to. So, yeah. so, yes, they were able to be talked back into coming – talked into coming back to Virginia Tech off a of three and eight season. They got one year left. You know, they want to win. So uh, good job by the coaches on convincing them to say. Not that they necessarily needed a lot of convincing. I, I don't know enough about what was going on through either guy's head. But, yes, you're right. That was a telling comment, I thought. Yeah. Um, he mentioned the Feldarius Payne is he's not sure where he's going to be. He's going to be a flex guy, DN, D-tackle. Um, uh, he mentioned Lamar Law had a toe injury, which is why he, he didn't do it as was much close to year. playing last year. Yeah, that's what JC said. And he, he talked a lot about the young guys and just – he said he likes his room, kind of where it's at right now. Um, there's a lot of depth at tackle. And J- it, it's funny, every time you talk to J.C., J.C. usually says defensive line, de- you know, defensive line is the most demanding position in football. Mm-hmm. J.C. always he says, says it every that. Time. Um, and that you can never have too many defensive linemen. And uh, I-, I thought overall he's probably got maybe the most returnees 
out of any maybe defensive back has most returns, but JC's got a good group, come, veteran group coming back that he knows. Sure. So I don't think there was anything, not a whole lot new. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. How about Pearson Prelude, the safeties coach for Virginia? Tech? Let's see what I wrote down for P- Pearson Prelude. He talked about um, a lot of the a lot of the new guys, and one of the things he he mentioned was how uh, last year Virginia Tech could only do so much. Tech was limited a little bit in in the staff limited in what the staff taught the players because they were trying to implement the system. And now everybody's on a different level. The, like the, the starting baseline is higher Correct. because all of the, the guys who were young last year, everybody has another year in the system. Um, he mentioned, we talked about a bunch of different guys. Um, Jalen Jones, he mentioned uh, switching to safety. Mm-hmm. Um, he played some in high school, played safety. T- uh, TJ in Richmond. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, I mean, I don't think it was anything specific. Mostly, he just really, really liked the way he was going to fit back there, Jalen Jones. Um, and mentioned Jalen Stroman. Uh, we talked to Moe's Phillips a little bit. Derek Canteen, and uh, he likes what Canteen can bring, the f- flexibility he can bring. And Sean Quinn mentioned him playing a little bit of nickelback, too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think I guess the main take we take away, I mean, everybody talked to him about the young players or they tried to, and he was like, yeah, we don't know who's going to be a corner or who's going to be safety. No. You know, we recruit defensive backs at Virginia Tech and then see where they where they fit after they get here. Yeah. So it was pretty short and pretty generic. Yeah. Uh, not not a whole lot. He talked a little bit about uh, Liberty last year and just it, just w- what it meant kind of to, to the program and um, not not a whole lot from Prelude, but some good individual stuff on on some of the younger guys. You sounded excited to talk about Sean Quinn, the Sam linebacker oh, sh- slash Nichols coach. He, so let's hear about he's, him. Sean is great. Um, he talked he talked a lot about uh, one of the one of the things I thought was really interesting is is he's got a different perspective since he's a head, he was a former head coach. Correct. And I asked Sean Quinn about if he noticed at all, you know, Brent Pry and Will Will's mentioned this, I think to Wit actually, that Brent Pry on uh, the podcast he did with Mike Burnup and Bill Roth, Level Seven podcast, Brent Pry mentioned that he wasn't didn't do as good of a job as a head coach as he should have because he was spending so much time calling plays and that sure. and that kind of stuff. So I asked Sean Quinn. Could you tell? What, did you give him any advice? And and um, his, his response was, I, I think one of the things that Pry had to figure out and slowly develop and realize was that he, you are the, the temperature, the thermostat in the room, right? Every time you walk into a room, you decide how how everybody else is going to kind of. What kind of day are we going to have? Yes, th- that's pretty a, That's a great way yeah. to put it. Um, but he did say one of the really great things was that that Pry listens and that. Somebody suggests something to him, and he kind of takes it and figures out how he can adjust as a result. And it, it's not just in one ear, out the other, or anything like that. Um, but I thought Sean Quinn's perspective was pretty good. Oh, that yeah. sounds like me. I, I set the tone for the room. I listen to people. I take the. <laughs> if Will comes in cussing, we know it's going to be a long day. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is you wanna, true. You want to mention what he said about Kelly Lawson? Um, he about, basically how, said Kelly Lawson's going to play in the NFL. That's essentially what he Ooh, said. No pressure there. Which, I mean, I I agree with. He I said, just look at the guy. Yeah. So we had our uh, – we had our – he keeps just – I mean, he keeps getting bigger, as you would expect, with his frame. And I think, you know, he played really well at the end of last year, and he would have started playing well earlier than that if he hadn't been injured in the preseason and if he had actually played linebacker during his redshirt year. And I thought what he did at the end of last year, considering his lack of experience at linebacker, was incredible. Um we saw him and in, the fact that he dealt with an injury. Right, right. So we saw him in the SAPC yesterday. He just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, he and the McDonald twins, in my opinion, are, are all have the opportunity to be NFL players. You, they, 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 not that everybody that looks like an NFL player is going to look is going to be an NFL player. Like Tech has had a few guys who looked the part in the past, but they were nowhere close to it. But those three guys, I think their work ethics are, are really, really high. And I think their heads are in the in the right spot. And I, and I think in each one of those specific positions, they're well coached. So uh, I'm I'm very high very high on all three of those guys. Um, one of the things I love so much about Sean Quinn is his uh, 
just the way he compares stuff, right? He mentioned Aretha. He's like, if you're going to play for Aretha Franklin, you have to play the blues. I think that's what he said. Something like that, um, yeah. But he also, one of the other things, one of the other important things that he mentioned was he said that he thinks the 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 positivity from the Liberty win carried over into the winter, into the spring, a little bit into the spring. I think a lot of the guy, the way he explained it was a lot of the guys, Tech had only won two games. And that can be mentally tough, right? You're putting in all the work and you're not winning. Everybody says trust the process, but then when you don't win, at some point you stop trusting that yeah. process, don't you? And so. and and he said that for everybody to kind of see hard work paying off to mm-hmm. get that win turned out to be the last game of the season. Then they carry it in into the spring. Everybody's a lot more fired up. Everybody's kind of ready to go. It's he said it's been a good winner. Well, uh, obviously, we talked about the fact that uh, Derek Jones was unavailable. You said he might be recruiting. Who knows where Probably he was? Recruiting. Uh, but he was not in attendance, unfortunately. That is Cheetah, so I was kind of bummed to not yeah. be able to uh, hear from him. Also, shout out to Kyle. He gave us a text for the 10-minute mark moments ago. So uh, we're moving at a good pace here, gentlemen. Uh, last but not least, on the defensive side, your defensive coordinator and linebackers coach, Chris Marv. This will probably be his first season actually calling the plays and truly being the defensive coordinator. Brent Pry has talked talked about how that was a mistake he made a year ago a little bit in some ways. Um, and you saw Chris Marv call all the plays in the Liberty game, and uh, now we're probably going to go into the first full season of that. Yeah, he mentioned one of the things he mentioned was seeing everybody, kind of the same thing as Sean Quinn, and he was before Quinn, but he said every, all the guys after the Liberty game got, got to see the fruits of the labor payoff, mm-hmm. and, and it's kind of motivate, motivated them to be better. Talked about Dax a little bit and how it's going to be, you know, you can't just replace Dax. Dax Hollyfield is not easy to replace. Um, and he mentioned, in terms of Mike, he wants everybody to have a primary, secondary position. That goes for all the linebackers. And he didn't really give any specifics on where they're going to practice a lot of guys. Just kind of said that there are a lot of, there's a lot of flexibility, but he wants to kind of narrow it down, be a little bit better than last year. I believe you asked a question in terms of guys playing yeah, different positions. Uh, you know, they, they had to play like at one point last year. Uh, which McDonald is it at the, that's a linebacker? It's Jaden, right? Jaden. Okay. Jayden. At, one, at some point last year, he played all three linebacker positions. And that that's too much on a young player, especially a young player who was a strong safety as a senior in high school, right? That, 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 that's a lot. That's easier on an older player. So it's all about striking the right balance. You do want people to have a secondary position, but you don't want to practice them so much at their secondary position. Like You want them to be as good as possible at their primary position because they're probably not going to have to be have to play their secondary position. So from that standpoint, any time spent practicing their secondary position takes away from how much better they get at their primary position. So it's always a balancing act there ultimately the older players get the less of an issue it is when a guy is really young i think it's more ideal for him to spend more time at one spot as opposed to having his head spinning playing so many different spots yeah the other thing marv said was he wants guys to stand up and stand out right Mm -hmm. he he doesn't he he wants to obviously it's open competition but he wants people to say take advantage of it and say look I am going to make the most of it, and I am going to show that I am going to be the starter at this position. No coach wants to pick their own starter at their respective position. You want them. They to want it to be obvious. They want it yeah. to be obvious who the starter is. They want the play that player to basically be so much better. No, you want to have good depth too. Don't get me wrong, but you want to look up at the end of the day and say, "Yeah, that guy's awesome." That you know, yeah. you don't even have to work for. It. You know who the starter's going to be. I love watching Chris Marv coach. He's so fired he, up. You know, he's, he's an energetic guy. Ever everybody's got their lists of guys they'd like to play for, and I go back. You know, having talked to all of Texas assistants over the last twenty plus years now, like Marv would be on my list of one of those guys I would like to play for because I think he's a good coach and he cares and he's highly intelligent and and yeah, he's a good communicator. All that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Looking Very smart. Came from Vanderbilt. And some of the yeah. words he uses, it's like, that guy knows what he's talking about. Really? Yeah. He's, a good commu- he's an excellent communicator. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very much so looking forward to seeing what he's got to offer on the play calling side of things this upcoming season. Let's shift to the offensive side of the football now. Um, we'll kind of go, I guess, bottom to top. You want to uh, start with Brad Glenn? Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon? <Nice. laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Let's start uh, with uh, Fontel Mines, offensive recruiting coordinator, coordinator and wide receivers coach. Recently just got a little bit of a paycheck. Yeah. Um, did. And uh, that was the first thing. Could you imagine? That was the first thing that he was asked. <laughs> um, and 
the first thing he said was loyalty was mm. the reason why he stayed, right? He mentioned that he had opportunities to go oh, elsewhere. I'm sure. So but, so let's establish for the fans the raise was from 275 to 425. Something like that. Yes. It was yes. a substantial it was like raise. A, and, I don't remember the percentage. I ran the numbers and did the math, but it was a it was a good bit. Like he he, seems, he got paid, but he got paid like and that helped. But he'd also moved five times in five years. Yeah. And and I was gonna say that he and he he felt like this is where he needed to be. And so I, I, asked, I asked him what made this place the right place, and he said the people. Right. And it's in his state and it's three hours from from his family yeah. in Richmond. And it's just so much easier for him. Uh, look, Penn State could still outbid us for Fontel Mines if they wanted, but once you get up to four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars as a wide receivers coach, is making five hundred thousand dollars, but moving to a different state, yeah. farther away from your family, is it worth it? You know, so uh, so I think I think he's very fairly compensated now, and it, it's indicative of, of what he means to the program from like like we value in state recruiting, and he's I think, probably the best recruiter they have. And I think in I think in state I mean, recruiting starts yeah. in Richmond. I think it's the most important part of in state rec- uh, recruiting, and he's excellent there. So I think that the value he's paid compared to what college coaches make these days, I think it's a fair reflection of what he means to the program. Yeah, he said he wanted to stay in Virginia. He talked about a, a couple of different different players um some of them i think andy bitter i believe asked him to uh, who's kind of stood out this spring or winter and he said tucker holloway and stephen gosnell mm-hmm. he said both of them got a lot better and he said gosnell's transformed his body i think that's probably a positive sign yeah and he, did, he didn't look quick last year in and out of his breaks and I th- at one point he was 215 and i think uh mine said he's 194 or thereabouts now that, so that should make him quicker that sounds about right thought, hey that's good look you got those transfers in right that's gonna make those other guys kick kick their game up mm-hmm. right that's that's the whole idea of that that's the whole idea of building competition so I think that's a good thing uh one of the other things I thought that was interesting is he said he's not gonna pigeonhole anybody into certain positions right mm-hmm. he didn't he didn't want anybody to say I am a slot receiver I am an outside receiver he wants everybody to kind of be able to play everything mm-hmm. he said Interesting. He wants to put the three best receivers on the field, and that's that. Ideally, yes. That, that yeah. That's certainly ideal. Now, of, of those three receivers, then you're like, okay. Who fits best where? Who fits best in the slot? But, yes, you want your three best players out there. Um, yeah, that was kind of it for Fontel Mines. I asked him about DeJuan Lofton, and, and he said that Lofton hasn't really flinched, and he's the only – you know, he, he is – he needs to be a starter for this group, and the only person that's really standing in Lofton's way of achieving that is him. So, uh, you know, it's bringing in those three transfers is it's just like I said, it's driving up competition. I agree. I mean, it's going to make everybody better. No doubt about it. Nothing on. He didn't mention Ali Jennings at all. Oh, we, I think we. No, asked, I think ever. I think. Oh, he mentioned he mentioned Jalen Lane. Jalen Lane, uh, that, and that was sorry. That was somebody at the top of the yes, list. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, because we first started to talk about him. Uh, when Mines was at East Carolina, Carolina he recruited Jalen Lane. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Lane's got two years of eligibility left, and he, he kind of just likes everything he brings. And Derek Jones has also knows the family really well. Yeah. So there was a lot of familiarity there with, with, with Jalen Lane before the recruitment to Virginia Tech even began. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. All right, let's go on to Joe Rudolph, run game coordinator and offensive line coach. Joe Rudolph was the last person we <laughs> talked was. to. First person we asked about. He might have talked the longest too. First person we asked about was Caden Moore. Um, who's going to play center? Who's going to play center? Um, what, what was that comparison he made about uh, kind of putting the idea in his ear and then it goes, it becomes his idea? <laughs> well, it's, he said it's like being married and you're you're trying to uh, yeah. talk your 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 significant other into into something <laughs> like you don't tell them right away this is what you you should do you kind of plant the idea and let them think it's their idea right that's Caden Moore yeah. with with playing <laughs> with playing center that's I'm, what Joe I'm, Rudolph I'm said. not married will any comments on that <laughs> uh none whatsoever because this is, podcast is publicly accessible and occasionally my <laughs> wife will watch them <laughs> uh, every uh, idea in our house is her idea <laughs> Oh, man, I'm trying to think of... Oh, I got one. I got one. Parker Clements. Oh, yeah, he did. Had a rough year last year and played better the last three games of the season. 
much closer to 2021 levels the last three games. Well, as it turns out, Parker Clements had a torn meniscus, head surgery, couldn't lift weights for and the four months leading six, into the season. He said 16 weeks? Yeah, 16 weeks. Four, yeah. The four months before the season couldn't lift weights. So, so he had no built-up strength when the season started. Yeah. Now, Tech lifts heavier during the season now than they used to in the past. So by the time November got here, he had some of that strength built back up. So he played better in November. So that was the issue with Parker Clements last year. I wish they had told us before there then. was an injury. So, yeah. so, so, like, I could have told people the, the reason his PFF grade is in the 40s, <laughs> right? right. Uh, so, it's so like, it didn't feel like they, you were picking on Parker Clemens, right? Exa- time, exactly. You know? So, uh, so, but the, the issue last year was not Parker Clements, it was the fact that Tech didn't have anybody else to put in while yeah. Clements was, was in his recovery phase basically yeah. like yeah. when he had recovered from the injury and the surgery he just had to build back up the strength from the four months that he didn't lift so now that i know that i feel so much better and we're gonna see the real parker clements this year i'm confident so it. listen man the struggle is real because i started working out with mitch ludwig the former tech punter in early 2021 yeah worked out with mitch all through 2021 through september of 2022 and then mitch moved on he left anytime fitness and my lard butt completely quit working out for three months after Mitch left. I didn't work out during football season last year. I went back into the gym in January, and the difference is profound. Mm-hmm. If you do not lift, that was just three months, 12, 13 weeks. Clements went 16 weeks. And you don't have to knock 300-pound people out of the way. You don't want to move. <laughs> no, I just got to do, you know, more than five push-ups when I try. So it, that's, a, that's a real thing, man. Yep. Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting because we had not heard anything about that. Um, one of the other guys you mentioned was Xavier Chaplin about how um, – it sounded like he was a little bit banged up for a lot of the year he last was. year, and then he played. He finally got a chance to play in the Liberty game. Mm-hmm. Um, Caden Moore, obviously, he said he, they don't have a lot of tackles, which is – They don't. Which we is, know that. Which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, he mentioned Lath Ganim uh, and his ability to potentially – he, he said he ex- kind of expects him to be – maybe he has a chance to be in the 2D oh, uh, he's, at, he's, at tackle. He's a four-star recruit in my book. Yeah, He's well, ex- I, I know how high you are on him. Uh, he said Garrett and Meadows, Johnny Garrett and Brody Meadows are tackles. Mm. Lance Williams is a guard who can play center as yep. well. Yep. And the, what do you say, swing tackle is Schick? Yes. Bob Schick, I believe? Yeah. Um, I, th- I think, I, I don't know that like Schick has the ceiling uh, of a guy like uh, Johnny Garrett. Uh, who was a high school tight end, just a big framed guy. Um, that offensive line is still in development stage with some of the young players, but uh, I feel like it's in better shape than it was at this time last year. At least I hope it is. Yeah, he mentioned there's a couple of different guys. It sounds like there's a lot of different, at least on the interior, position flexibility where there's a bunch of different guys that can play center. Like Caden Moore obviously is going to slide to center, so that opens up a, another guard spot. Yes, so, so let me jump in here and listen to the names that you were reeling off. It sounds like, I don't keep as close track of this stuff as you guys do, it sounds like most or all of the true freshman offensive linemen are already here. I think uh, all of them, are, or at least I'd have to look at right, the Lance list. Williams is here, I know, because I saw him in the, he in the facility yesterday. And he yesterday. mentioned Ganim. Uh, nice Ganim. Ganim's here. I, I, uh, the kid from Pennsylvania, Bishop McDevitt. Um, Arena. Uh, yeah, Gabriel, Gabriel Arena. I don't yeah. think he's not here. I don't believe. Okay. And I don't remember whether Hans Hammer. I think he is here. He mentioned Hans Hammer. Okay, yesterday. so I think three of the four are here. That's awesome. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Stu Holt. He is the special <laughs> teams coordinator, assistant head coach, and offense slash running backs coach. Uh, Bashul. Bashul Tutin. Bashal. Bashal. Yeah, like Bashal. It's, it's like, it looks like Bashal. Pr- pr- pronounce yes, it like you're from yes. the deep south. Bashal. Instead Bay-shul. of instead of Bashul, like it looks at shawl, like you're wearing a shawl around Bay-shul. you, like y'all. Uh, yeah. Bashal. Uh, Bashal. Uh, he said he was committed to Boston College. He was. I, I remember when Tech offered him, and I'm like, oh, that, and I watched him on some film, and I'm like, man, that's a good offer. That guy's pretty good. And then he committed to Boston College, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And then I <laughs> forgot about him and until then, he, out of nowhere he commits to Tech at the end. And Stu Holt was kind of like, yeah, I kind of just kept on it, and and he was like, yeah, I'm coming to Tech. Flip, <laughs> flip from Boston College. He was a class of 2021 guy. So he was a true freshman in 2021, true sophomore in 2022. He was in that 2021 class that basically never got to be evaluated in person by college coaches. Yeah. So Holt was basically like, 
Like this guy played FCS football. He never should have been an FCS recruit. And if it wasn't for COVID, if coaches could actually go out and evaluate, he would have been on an FBS roster. Yeah, hmm. and he said is and there's a lot of guys like that. He, he's like, yeah. there's a lot of guy that it, guys that ended up on FBS rosters that should have been FCS players, and vice versa, right. because coaches couldn't go out and evaluate during that year. So you, you've seen a lot of player movement. Is is that situation corrects itself? Yeah, a lot of just, so the, so this is part of the correction of that. Bashal Bashal Tutin <laughs> is now playing FBS football, which is where he should have been from the very beginning. It's interesting. There's been a lot of FBS to FCS and vice versa movement through the transfer portal, and that'll probably always be true. But it'll be interesting to look at the stats over the years and see if that settles down more as yeah. we get further away from COVID. Yeah, uh, he mentioned Tutin can change on a dime. Um, I know we're going to talk about Tyler Bowen in a sec, but Bowen said uh, um, he praised. Tootin's explosiveness and said he has a powerful build. And again, mentioned he can change direction really well. Um, Malachi Thomas, he said he's doing great. Uh, he said Thomas's injury, I don't know if we knew this, Thomas's injury last year came, he just got rolled up in a drill. Um, yeah, and a non-contact drill. Yeah. Um, what defender did that? Oh, gosh, run laps, dude. <laughs> um, as far, and then that, that there wasn't a, I mean, he talked a little bit about the, the younger running backs and, and Bryce Duke and yeah. Will's man crush Bryce Duke, I should say. And, uh, and, and, <laughs> and, Chance, and Chance Black and I'm trying to think, uh, Kenji Christian. He kind of mentioned those guys, but he didn't go into a lot of detail. What he did mention was punt returner yeah. and how Tech has two potential options at, at punt returner. Lane with, with Jalen Lane back there uh, to challenge Holloway. Last year, at this time last year, they didn't have anybody who could return punts. And then Tucker took one to the house. Now they got two guys. And it wasn't just that he took the one to the house. It's like he's really good at fair catching him and making decisions on when to fair catch and things like that. So there's a situation where Tech is will certainly be better this year from start to finish. Uh, They have two punt returners rather than none. They started the year off with none. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, Who start, DJ Harvey started at the beginning, right, as the punt returner? Yeah, Yeah. and I don't remember if there was somebody between him and Howell. I mean, Will Kakavisis. Did he actually return? Yeah. Did he? Did he? Uh, no, no, he was not. Bryce was on kickoff. Bryce return, Duke so. returned kickoff. kickoff. Bryce, Bryce Duke did, and Chance Black did kickoff Chance too. Black, who with Ch- Keyshawn King. Yeah, who uh, Holt mentioned that he's still going to be a running at running back. Uh, he also mentioned PJ Prelu, who's of course a walk special on, teams guy, but he's yeah. he's going to be at running back too. Is he? That's what he meant. No, I thought. Oh, no, he's, sorry. He, he mentioned special he teams. blocked a punt. That's yes, what it was. Yeah, that's what it was. Sorry, I did not mean that. That was incorrect. Um. I asked him about Tucker Holloway, kind of what made Tucker Holloway such a, like, burst on the scene out of nowhere. He said he really just didn't waste any time. We were kind of looking for a, a guy, and we figured, well, we're not getting much out of this. Let's try to see if he can change something up. And he did change something up, obviously. He fair, his first game was Thursday night under the lights on ESPN against NC State, and he fair caught every single point. Which was an improvement. <laughs> Previous guys weren't catching the ball, and it was just bouncing that, fifteen extra yeah. yards. And and then wait, but didn't wasn't the NC State game one where we fumbled, we muffed one? Oh, Jalen Holston muffed it or picked it back up after he, a muffed, or was that a kickoff? That was a kickoff. That was a kickoff. But that was the NC State game. Yes, okay. um, yes, that was the NC State game. But then Holloway, of course, Georgia Tech was the next game, and he returned one for a touchdown. So, and on top of that, not even just the touchdown, he also broke the record for the most return yards right. in a game for Virginia Tech. Yeah. That's the and the thing is like. I don't think he had any returns at all in any other game. So, like, he's good. Don't get me wrong. Georgia Tech's punt coverage team is horrible. <laughs> so, Fair. Yeah. horrible. So, you can't he, – he, he did a good job last year. <laughs> but he's still got – still got. it's still not for sure that he's better than Lane. Once again, we're <laughs> talking about Tucker Holloway a lot on a podcast. We are. I'm just getting a kick out of that. I yeah. think we should throw Carter Hill back there and see what happens. You know <laughs> – oh, God. You know – <laughs> I, I think he's a valuable member of our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, well, okay. So one other thing I thought was interesting. We talked a little bit about special team. So it's funny. Stu Holt, Stu Holt was the only person that came with a list. He came with like a note card and had all these notes written out. He's ab- like, you didn't ask me any questions about special teams. I well, about, ab- about kickers and stuff. <laughs> um, he, he touched a little bit about Will Ross and Kyle Low or, or John John, John Love, Kyle Low. Yeah, uh, right. who, who, who did kickoffs last year? I can't remember. Kyle Low did kickoffs. Yes, yeah, him. John loves the true freshman. Out of Forty-two. That, yes, t- touchbacks yeah, he, or something. Yeah. T- he praised about uh, his touchbacks. What I didn't think was interesting is he said one of the reasons Peter Moore struggled was he was they never 
I guess Shibes never asked him to punt directionally. That that was something he mentioned that that Peter yeah. Moore was never really asked to punt directionally. He was kind of just get it out, just, just kick it as far as you can. Yeah, because he has such good hang time. Yeah, interesting. So so just so a that, different. He, he said that's one of the yeah. Just a little bit different. Different philosophies. Yeah, there. which I think is kind of one of the reasons why he said he struggled last year at times. So it'll probably be John Love place kicking this year though, right? You'd have to think. <laughs> Ross is gone, and they also like he, took him out. Yes. Towards the end of so last year, gone to his fourth college now. Or did he graduate? Or did he just graduate? I don't know the answer to that. I don't remember because he was like South Carolina, Coastal Carolina, Virginia. I have to, look at, Carolina, Virginia. Poor, like, I have to yeah. look at my scholarship list. Poor John Love, the first field goal, not extra point. I think he did an extra point or two before that. The first field goal they had him attempt was like a fifty-four yarder at Duke, <laughs> and I don't think it got to the ten-yard line. We are also ran a speed option to him. I've been oh god! Uh, I've been begging for a speed option all year, and then we Running ran one to, with John Love. That's all just, I got. Just that, what that's I That's all I got wanted. on Stu Holt. That's all I've got too. All right, Tyler Bowen, offensive coordinator and tight ends coach, feels like there's a little pressure on this him. Is this is funny. Year. Nobody asked him about tight ends at all. This oh, I was <laughs> well, I, th- I thought about it, and then I was like, I, I was going to ask about Gosnell. Yeah, and yeah. just his and his and his recovery, but Gosnell's probably not going to play much. Who Benji? Yeah, yeah, Benji Gosnell. Yeah, sorry, the other Gosnell. Uh, you already know what you have with Nick Gallo and Daquan Wright. So, right. Um, I'm excited th- th- to see Wright, man. Uh, Bowen's the last one, yeah? Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. right, cool. Right. Uh, let's see. He well, men- Brad's he- coming up, but He, men- he mentioned <laughs> that uh, it, it's part of the profession, just the, kind of the Brad Glenn situation and, and guys leaving, and he said he was happy for him and his family. Um, in, in terms of what – somebody asked him what he was looking for in an offensive coordinator – or not sorry, what he was looking for in a quarterback coach. And he mentioned he kind of want, you know, just a sounding board. Those guys are important to have. And he wants somebody that can teach that that knows technique in as far as it, it goes with quarterbacks. Um, which I feel like is kind of self explanatory, right? Yeah. Um and that's but that's what what Brad Glenn was for him. He was a sounding board. Um he mentions that that they need to keep evolving. And that's something that Pry mentioned offensively last year. And Bowen's mentioned before, and they kind of keep mentioning it. They need to, to evolve. Um, he said he's not pleased at all and doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Um, what were your overall takeaways from from talking with Bowen? Because it wasn't like there were a lot of details said. I think it was kind of just a lot of overarching. He's a very intelligent, likable guy. Um, uh, coordinators are going to speak in generalities, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steinspring used to try to talk specifics with you in interviews, and he'd go on these long, rambling rants that nobody understood. So <laughs> everybody wants co- coordinators to be more honest with them, but, like, no, you don't, because they're, they're, they're going to start spitting stuff that you don't even understand, right? So, I'm, I'm again, I think he, this whole staff is very good at communicating, and I think Bowen's an excellent communicator. Um I don't know how much he gave away in that interview in terms of, of you know, what he's looking for. Uh we don't know if the new guy is going to have, have the title passing game coordinator or not, but that'll be up to pry. But that's just the title. In reality, every quarterback's coach is going to work with the offensive coordinator on the passing game, You know whether that's your title or not. That's just, that's just the way things work. Um, he knows things have to get better. Uh, we didn't ask him specifically about his relationship. With Glenn, I'm not this relationship. I think his relationship with Glenn was fine, but whether he they felt were, like they were the right yeah. fit, but it doesn't matter at this point, and I wouldn't expect him to a- answer yeah, that. Yeah, anyway. because Glenn's gone. He's and gone. Again, well, there's what, not what's much the point, point to ask. Ex- here. Exactly. Um, he he wants. He talked about the the difficulties and like you feel like you just you 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 need to simplify things while also presenting to the opposition that you're capable of doing a lot of things. Right and using formations to being disguise com- what, being you're ca- what you're trying to do, while also being simple, making yes. it easy for the players. Correct, while also presenting, the, or at least presenting the front that you're yeah. complex to yeah, the opposition. It was interesting. Right? He was kind of like you know, so you can shift this here and do this here and move guys around, so it looks really complicated. But on the surface, when, as far as the players, for the players, the players may have are easy to you know understand it. Easily. Yeah, so I, I once heard that the secret to running a good offense, and I don't know if I'm just speaking out of the side of my neck or what, is being able to run a lot of plays out of just a few formations yeah. or just a few plays out of a lot of formations. So uh, you remember the old Syracuse offenses under Donovan McNabb in the 90s. Do you remember the thing about them is 
they were noted for how many different formations they had. I think they had something like 33 different formations. Yeah, they were good. Those guys were good. You weren't even born. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but everybody thought, oh, wow, what a complex offense. It's probably not. It's probably just a lot of the same plays after uh, with under different formations. Yeah. So, like, you can run the same speed option play with a tight end in the game or with a slot receiver in the game. That's two different formations, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so when you when you when you get it down to it, like you probably don't reckon you probably don't realize exactly how many formations there are. Um, so Syracuse is an example. I think they did. They didn't have a large number of plays, but they had a lot of formations that you had to prepare for. So when there's a lot of formations, it's like okay, as a defender, it's it's more about where do I line up. That's where that can be confusing. I don't have a preference on which style is is right, right. but but that that's the subtle difference between the two. Sounds like my playbook in NCAA, just a bunch of different formations. There you <laughs> go. Anybody got anything else before we wrap things up? No, I I well I thought I was going to say I thought the media luncheon was really good. Yes, and that's actually what I want to ask you guys about. Yeah. Uh, there was a and help me get the wording correct. There was a what I consider to be a jaw dropping comment made that they want to be the most media friendly football program in the country did they say something <laughs> they, they like did that? They yeah. well, i think they said, said athletic that. department as a whole i yeah. love that yeah brad um, broadworth said for, that good for yeah. us uh, i don't yeah. quite know what to make of that that's, yeah. that's... <laughs> and, I, and i will say this well we had whit babcock on the podcast we're gonna have brent pry next by the week. way we got pry next tuesday yeah, so. um we got all the coaches so, yesterday. so here's an example of of that in action uh we're trying to figure out what, what, we, what we could do with pry we've got pry for an hour-long podcast on tuesday then David, the very next day, has a one-on-one -on -one with him. Don't be telling the rest of the media we've oh, got man, all this stuff. Uh, you know, sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, but, well, we're live, so but, yeah. it's but, there. I mean, it's not like they're not getting one. I mean, Andy said, yeah. Andy and Teal. They're all in town. Yeah. They're getting what they're, they want. You know, yeah. right. I, but, but, but anyway, I, that's pretty they're, impressive. They're, I, I, they're being open, right? And, and a lot of the stuff we talked about yesterday were little tidbits here and there about Ways to simplify stuff. So, like, instead of, and for all you folks listening out there, I don't know if you knew the media schedule last year, but we talked to Brent Pry on Tuesdays. In terms of Justin Fuente, we'd talk to him, like, Mondays. We talked to Brent Pry on Tuesdays and a player, and that would be on Zoom and in person, which is helpful for other media who are trying to cover from far away. Wednesday, we'd talk to some players on Zoom in the morning, and then we'd go to practice. And after practice, we'd talk to Brent Pry literally, like, right outside or inside of the strengthening of the, of the weight room and able to talk to him after practice and a couple players. And then on Thursday, we got an assistant coach on zoom. And one of the things we talked about was just compressing all of that. But I, I do think that tech has done a good job, not just with football, but across all sports in terms of media access and working with us and, and, and being honest. And, you know, when we reach out and say, Hey, can we have somebody on? They're not saying no, sorry. They're Without, not saying automatically saying shooting it down. Right? Yeah, sure. they're they're trying to to work, and I, and it's not like we're asking every single week. Hey, can we have somebody? And on they the take podcast? our feedback and within reason. Like, yeah, and sometimes I, they apply it, sometimes they don't. Yeah. But that's fair. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's important to mention that I thought it was good. They so they had all the media together in the student athlete performance center and fed us. It was really good food and yeah, um and Travis Wells, who's the football um, sports information director, and Brad Worthen was there, and they kind of just. Asked around for different ideas from everybody. David Teal, Andy Bitter were there. Some of the local TV folks were there. Uh, so yeah, it was it was good. So parents of recruits, and I don't just mean <laughs> he's gonna, I, I don't just you gonna mean, hype up the student athlete performance center. I am. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, and I wouldn't hype up anything unless I didn't believe it was worth hyping. <laughs> and uh, so, true. So just be, so just be redshirt. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Red shirt and spend all your red shirt. You're in the student athlete performance center. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, but no, parents. Seriously, parents, if you got any kid being recruited by Virginia Tech for whatever sport and you, you, you want to take them on a visit to tech or whatever, like don't take them on a Saturday when like there's a football game and the student athlete performance center isn't really being used. Like, yes, go on a Saturday too and experience game day. Don't get me wrong. But if you really want to get a feel for Virginia tech and what it's like to be a student athlete of Virginia tech, visit at noon on a Wednesday and see like the activity that's in that place like that place was I, packed I, it was yesterday. packed and i like the interaction uh 
It was everything Wit Pat Wit, Wit described as from like a student athlete experience. Yeah. And I remember Trey Turner once upon a time saying it was neat being in the same place with athletes from other sports. Yeah, right. right. I mean, I, I walk. Grant Bazzilli walked by me. When, yeah, they're when, all when friends I with each in. other. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. You've got like probably like I mean I couldn't identify everybody and I wasn't exactly paying attention, but I'm sure you know they're track and field athletes and swim and dive or it's, it's, it's and, a more and close soccer lacrosse. Yeah, track. it's a more close knit athletics community now that that place exists yeah. i'm so, doing a, a project with sean padula and then three women's lacrosse players and they're like all friends with each other and i'm just like the outsider and like yeah, yeah i got invited <laughs> yeah. to do the project but i'm like these people are clearly best bffs you know yeah. what i mean interesting um but right. yeah that's all i got yeah Trying to, it was it, really good food. Red shirt, and then eat there three times a day, and then you'll be ready to roll. <laughs> and subscribe to techsideline.com. Yes. Do that. And check out TSL today. Kyle and Carter uh, had Chris Irons on, did a nice job. That's where you can find your fill. Notice how we didn't talk basketball, women's basketball, softball, baseball, any of the other stuff going on. You can find it all right there. But uh, I think that wraps things up. That'll do it for today. Episode 285 of the Tech Sideline Podcast presented by First Bank and Trust Company and the Hokey Way. Thanks for watching and listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube. And we will see you right here next time next week on the Tech Sideline Podcast. Take care, everyone.